As she said, most of them today deal with what happens when you die. Here are the questions that were sent in. Um, is there some sort of hell or purgatory experience before heaven? Since Jesus descended into hell and then ascended into heaven, is that what we're going to do too? Are we reunited with loved ones in heaven? Will we know our families in heaven? Is the spirit alive in heaven before judgment day? Are there degrees of heaven according to how you used your talents here on earth? If you give more money, time, or devotion to the church, are you loved more or treated better in heaven? Does the Bible say anything about cremation or standard burial as it relates to the resurrection? Do souls return to another life? And finally, will there always be room in heaven since so many people have been born and died since the beginning of time? Is heaven endless? Wow, so many questions about what is to come. It kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to Nicodemus at night when he came and they talked together. Nicodemus was one of the most learned religious men of his day. And Jesus said to him, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And I've always taken that to mean that Jesus wasn't able to fill Nicodemus in on everything he might have about what is to come because we're still, as believers here, so in need of focusing on God with us in this world and in this life and that Jesus couldn't fill him in on everything then. Um, he continues and says to Nicodemus, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Which I take to mean that there is no one walking on earth today who's been in heaven. One notable exception is Jesus Christ our Lord. Because once you go there, you're not coming back here. Now concerning rewards in heaven. I remember one time Jesus, it's in Matthew 19. He's talking to a rich man about spiritual life and spiritual things. And this man, he loves God. He's trying to follow God, but he's got so many possessions it's getting in the way of his life belonging to the Lord. And Jesus can see that. So he says to the man, just give it all away. Give it to the poor. you got better riches in heaven anyway. And you come and you follow me today. But that man went away very sad because he had great wealth and he, he couldn't give it up. And Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich person to get to heaven. It's harder than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which was Jesus' way of saying, this is something only God can accomplish. But Simon Peter's looking at this, and all of a sudden he gets a thought. Hey, we did that. We gave up everything, Jesus, and we followed you, right? What are we going to get? Is it going to be great, Jesus? Are we going to get like lots and lots of stuff in heaven because we're one of the original 12 disciples and all? Is that going to be like better stuff for us? And Jesus said, oh yeah. More than you can imagine. They're going to be cities, thrones, kingdoms, all of that. And Jesus said, no one has, who is, well, wrong quote. Okay, anyone who has left houses or family or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much. But... Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Careful, Peter. It's not always what it seems. And then he tells Peter a parable which seems to contradict the parable we heard in our gospel reading for today. And then he ends that parable with, so you see, lots of people are last who are going to be first, and first who are going to be last. The Bible it's pretty good at telling us two contradictory things and then saying they are both true if you understand them correctly and if you let God work out the details and just believe it, that it's going to happen like he says. For instance, in our gospel reading today, Jesus says that in heaven, you're going to have more things depending on what you do with what you have on earth here. More cities, it says. What's a city? I don't know. You know, is it riches? Is it responsibilities? Is it opportunities? Is it status? It's something good, right? And depending on what you do with your life here, it's going to have an effect there. But 
in the parable that Jesus told Peter when Peter said, oh, what are we going to get? He says, let me tell you, heaven's kind of like a man who owns a vineyard. And he's got to have people working in that vineyard. And some people come start right at the beginning of the day and they're working hard and they're working long hours and they're sacrificing, they're sweating. And some people come in the middle of the day and start working and some people way at the end. And when it comes time to get paid, the guy pays them all the same amount, which causes some people to say, hey, this isn't really fair. And you can see how that relates to heaven because some people are dedicated to God their whole life and they sacrifice for God and they, they, they give a lot and such. And other people, well, maybe they're not as serious in following God or they join up the cause later on in life. And then there are some people who have deathbed conversions and, and, and they all get the same heaven, right? Because heaven is not something you earn. It's a free gift. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus is the only one who earned heaven. The rest of us, we believe in him, and he just gives us out of love this amazing gift of eternal life in him. But Peter, there's going to be this big switch because a lot of people who look like they're big shots in God's kingdom here, they're really not. There's going to be a lot of switching first and last when God reveals exactly what is what because God knows the heart. And so we can, by that parable, have the confidence that if we have Jesus, we have eternal life. It's sure and it's certain the kingdom of heaven is ours. Having that, what do we do with it? It says in 2 Corinthians 7, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body or spirit perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. It's saying that since we already have eternal life, let's live it out in a response to God. Let's please him. Let's live the best we can, a holy life, a, a life of giving, because God has already given us far more than we deserve. We don't do it so that God can give us more. Again, God knows the heart like we never could. Imagine you're a wealthy person and you've got people hanging around you. You might never know, are they doing this because they like me and we're friends or are they trying to get something from me? God doesn't have to question. He sees the heart. And what he's looking for are people who live a life in response to grace and love God back. Not calculating souls trying to get more rewards. God's always about the motivation of the heart. Reminds me of a story I heard when I was a boy. There was this farmer, and this farmer grew the greatest turnip he had ever grown. Whoop, wrong one. I'm hitting the wrong button. There we go. Turnip, all right? He had grown turnips his whole life long. He'd never gotten one that perfect. This was the very best turnip. I can't believe I finally achieved turnip perfection. What a great turnip. What am I going to do with it? And he thought, this is a turnip fit for the king. I'm going to give this turnip to the king. And so he brings it to the king and he says, oh king, I grew the best turnip. I want you to have it. And the king said, that is really great. I want to give you something too. What do I have here? And he gave him a lump of gold about as big as a golf ball and said, here, something for you. And there was a guy watching this and said, hmm, how am I going to get in on that? And this was a kind of a wealthy guy, so he thought, I know what I'm going to do. He brought a set of matching stallion horses, beautiful, best in the land. And he brought them to the king and he said, oh, king, I think these are worthy of you. I give you the best team of horses in the land. And the king said, hmm, this is great. I should give you something. What am I going to give you? I know. I'll give you something that cost me a lot of gold. And you can guess. He gave the guy the turnip because he knew what the guy was after, right? Throughout Scripture, God is looking for a heart that responds to God's grace as the motivation for how we live our life, for giving, for serving, for holiness, for our choices in life, because we want to give back to the God who has been so good to us that we've gotten to know because of his heart in Christ and his love for us. And if that is where you start, then degrees of heaven are more easy to understand, I think. 
I'm not going to say with the person who wrote in the question that God loves some people more in heaven. But what I will say is that God loves some choices on earth that we make more than other choices, and they have consequences in the life to come. God doesn't spell it out. He doesn't give us details. He doesn't tell us much about what that is like, just that they're there. For instance, in that second reading, he talks about how everybody who is saved has a firm foundation in Jesus Christ, their Savior. And then he says it matters how you build your life on that foundation. What's the quality of the materials you use to build your Christian life there? Are you using silver, gold, costly stones? What really takes a sacrifice and an effort? Or wood, it's pretty good, or hay or straw. Because a day is coming that's going to show the quality of your work. And then it says, if what that person has built survives, he'll receive a reward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. Like you had to run through the fire to get through it. I knew a pastor who said, in heaven there are going to be some people who smell like smoke because, you know, the quality of their life was burned up. And what did he mean by that? I think what he meant was, we all know Christians who, uh, they believe in Jesus as their Savior, but they're not living a very Christian life. And it might cause you to think to yourself, well, how is God going to deal with that? I mean, they've been such a nasty person. They've hurt so many people. What, what's the deal? Is it the same when we get to heaven, considering all the people that, that they've hurt? And what, I think what God is telling us here is don't worry about it. He's got it all worked out. He's a just and true God, while at the same time being able to be a God completely of grace. Bible says in Revelations 14, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they'll rest from their labors for their deeds will follow them. It's saying that God will remember our deeds when we get to heaven. And not only that, it says they're blessed from now on from the time they die. It's not like you die and then you got to go through this period that's not so good before you get, you know, to where you're going to go. No, not at all. St. Paul reflected this when he said in uh, Philippians 1, I desire to depart this world, to die, and to be with Christ, which is far better. So when you die, your body decays, but your spirit returns to God who gave it. It's there until Judgment Day and the Resurrection. And the Bible says um, you're with the Lord if you're a believer. About cremation, the Bible doesn't say anything, really. Um, years and years ago, there may have been people who uh, got cremated because they did not believe in the resurrection, and so they said, you know, we're going to spoil that, like God wasn't powerful enough to, to work with that. But that's really not a consideration anymore. If you think about it, your body's going to turn to dust somehow, some way, with enough time, uh, no matter what way you choose. There is something beautiful about a natural burial, the normal burial, because, you know, the body is asleep. It's going to rise up again. But I don't think God really cares which way you choose. Um, I was talking with a guy in my last church and he was an old man. He was a shut-in. In his younger days, he was the gravedigger at the church in the church cemetery. And he told me about a time when he was working in the very old section of the cemetery where they didn't have vaults and where they weren't exact on the measurements always. And he had to put a new grave in between two very old graves. And he said, uh-oh, we don't have very much space here. This is going to be tight. And he's digging down below, and he's got a casket, old casket exposed on either side of him. And when he's down there working, all of a sudden the side of one of them falls open. And I said to him, what did you see? You know? And he said, I saw a very old, dignified man with a beard, with his hands like this, dressed in nice, formal clothing. And then when the air hit him, he just kind of went, poof. Wow. What did you do then? Well, I put the side of the casket back up and smeared a little bit of clay just on the side of it, and then I got out of there. You know? <laughs> Our body 
returns to dust. The Spirit returns to God as us. Jesus said to that thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now the other parts of the Bible, like 1 Peter 3, that say some souls are in prison, a place where you don't want to be until judgment day. Kind of trapped. Um, about recognizing people, well, Jesus said a story about a rich man and poor Lazarus, and if you remember that story, they recognize each other. So I think you will recognize each other in the age to come and in the kingdom of God. I think you will recognize your family, but I also believe that the love of God will be so tangible and pure and everywhere that it will bind the people of God together in um, imperfection far greater than just your love for people on this earth would. As to the question about souls returning, well, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. There is a direction to your life. There's no such thing as reincarnation in the Bible, period. There's no talk in the Bible of souls coming back to haunt the earth. We die, and then is the reward. Uh, judgment day. But concerning judgment day, I think there's another example here. The Bible says two seemingly contradictory things that it says are both true. Because it says very clearly in 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And again, in Revelation, no, Romans 14, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But then it says in Romans 8, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 8, it says God has forgotten all of our sins. And Jesus says in John chapter 5, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So what do you think is going to happen on Judgment Day when you rise from the dead as a believer? Are you going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and are you going to face judgment? Is it going to be public? Is God going to unlock all the locked cabinets in your mind and in your memory and everything you can't remember and drag out everything shameful and everything wrong and everything hurtful you ever did for everyone to see on Judgment Day? Or does a Christian get to skip that part because he's already forgiven? The Bible seems to say both things, doesn't it? It says we all stand before the seat of Christ on Judgment Day. And then it also says, you know, you will not be judged. So I think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 with the great sheep and the goats judgment. Because there's a judgment day and there is a division between the sheep and the goats. But remember what he said to the sheep? He doesn't mention a single thing that they've done wrong. Instead, he only mentions what they've done right. He says, come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. And inheritance being something you never earned. Take your inheritance, the kingdom, prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the sheep will say, oh, we don't remember doing any of these things. And God will say, I remember. I remember every time you did. These are the deeds that follow them, I think, that have an impact on the life to come. So when I think of Judgment Day, I think there will be a great judgment before the seat of Christ between those who are his and those who are not, but I believe that those who are his will not face the shame and humiliation instead for them. They will see how very thoroughly in every way their life has been noticed and thoroughly loved by the God of all who gives them richly far more than they deserve and welcomes them into the kingdom. So that's what I think will happen about 
degrees of heaven and the questions that were asked. Took a little longer than normal because you asked a lot of questions. So I'm very glad no one asked about the degrees of hell because we can skip that part. But there are two others that people ask we didn't quite get to. They're easy. Yes, there will be room in heaven for all believers. Jesus said, John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. My Father's house has many rooms. Wouldn't I have told you if it weren't the case? So yeah, there's all the room for all of God's people there. Second, uh, we do not descend into hell before going to heaven. No, that was only Jesus. He went there to announce the victory of what he had accomplished. On May the 14th, a few Sundays ago, I preached on the descent into hell. If you want to know more about it, it's like half a sermon on that. So just go back to our website, look up May the 14th, and you can hear all about Jesus descending into hell and what that was all about. For us, when you die, your body returns to dust. For the believer, the spirit returns to God, to be with God, to be in glory, and to await judgment day when God will show you how he has noticed you as his child and bring you then with all the saints of God into the kingdom everlasting. Amen.